Thank you, dear chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. I see most of you are still in lunch. <laughs> so we're, we're talking about subscap tears. As you all know, up till now, it seems that subscap tears still, as we may say, strike fear in the hearts of our throat. Is done by Dr. John Tokish. Among 200 doctors, they still feel that the subscap is the most difficult arthroscopic case in shoulder surgery. And the difficulty is usually, according to them, in tear pattern and visualization of the tear, how to visualize the tear. So hopefully, by the end of this lecture, I'll be lucky enough to, to give you a, so, a few pearls and tips on how to do it. So why is it a problem? Because as you can, as you can see here, the subscap, actually, the video's got messed up. The lesion on the left, when I started arthroscopy, I would usually not repair this lesion. I wouldn't even notice it. But nowadays, it's considered a high-grade partial tear of the subscap, and it should be, should be repaired. Oh, my videos are mixed up right now. So the incident of subscap tears, isolated tears are not common, only about 5%, but combined tears with the supraspinatus are very common. You just need to look for them. There are about 30% of the cases with a supraspinatus tear will have a subscap tear. You know there's this classification for subscap tears developed by Dr. LaFosse, Partial grade one and then grade two, three, four are complete tears according to the degree of the tear. The comma sign, if you heard about it, most of the time you can see it, sometimes not. It's just the reflected part of a coracohumeral ligament. If you can see it, then you can probably, you're sure that there's a subscap tear. And you can try to preserve it because it will help you reduce the rest of the rotator cuff. There are many tests for subscap tears. How I clinically suspect a subscap tear, two important points. If a patient has significant functional impairment that doesn't really correlate to the tear size, if a patient has a, a small supraspinatus tear but he's clinically impaired and in severe pain, I would suspect that there's a function, there is a subscap tear because there's something wrong with the force coupling. Another test that I use always is the bear hug test. I find it very sensitive in diagnosing upper border tears. MRI. If you're waiting for the MRI report to diagnose a subscap tear, you're probably going to miss it. MRI is not sensitive in detecting subscap tears. Very seldom will you find what we see here, a retracted tendon, a dislocated biceps, a bare lesser tuberosity, or fatty, uh, fatty infiltration or atrophy of the muscle belly. It's not common to find these tears. You usually only find them in large, massive traumatic tears. So do, it's, if you're relying on an MRI, it's not sensitive. To try to improve the sensitivity, uh, uh, Dr. Chris, Ahmed, uh, Chris Adams and Dr. Burkhardt came up with a four-criteria approach. And if you find any of these two criteria, then the patient probably has a subscap tear. But still, it's not very sensitive. You should rely on arthroscopic findings. And it's, it's unlikely that you go to do an arthroscopy is just if, for a subscap tear. You usually do it for a combined tear, a supraspinatus. So we're going in anyways, but you have to look for the subscap. I, on an MRI, if I find an anterosuperior cuff tear, a tear that involves the anterior part of a supraspinatus, then I always suspect that there's a subscap tear as well. So anterosuperior cuff tears, you should suspect a subscap tear as well. How I do it, this is how I do it, and this is how I teach all my fellows, beach chair position. You need three portals, a posterior viewing portal and two anterior portals. The antero superior portal, the regular anterior portal through the interval, and then an anterolateral portal. Yes, this is, if you see the biceps of 
severe underfraying on this under surface. This is called the sentinel sign. And this probably means that this biceps is rubbing on the subscap tear. And it, if you see the sign under surface fraying on the biceps tendon, then you should know that there's a subscap tear underneath. I always start by doing a bicep stenotomy. This is the first step. I do a bicep stenotomy. It clears up the rotator interval, and then I can work much more freely. So I start by doing a bicep stenotomy. And then I do an extensive interval release through my anterior portal. I release the whole rotator interval all the way to the coracoid and clear up the anterior space. Do not go medial to the coracoid as you can injure important neurovascular structures. So that's the second step. The third step, which is the most important step, is to create this anterolateral portal. This portal you should locate it outside in and it should be right above the upper border of the subscap. So this is your anterolateral portal. This is the most important step, I think. So you should create this anterolateral portal and you should use it in four important steps. The first step is to complete your lateral interval release. You need to clear up the tissue from the lateral interval. And you should be aggressive because you have to find the free end of the subscap. Most of the tissue here is just fibrous tissue, trials of healing. Don't be afraid, be aggressive, try to remove all this fibrous tissue, get to find the free edge, and to clear up the footprint, the lesser tuberosity for your repair. So as you can see here, I've, there we found the free edge of the subscap, the upper part is torn. If you grab it and pull, as you can see, there, you can see the rolled up upper border of the subscap and the middle guinea humeral ligament that was retracted. Then, through the same portal, I have to release my middle guinea humeral ligament completely because this middle guinea humeral ligament is a tethering structure. This is number one. Number two is that you can get, catch it in your repair and it will limit the range of motion if you do. So anterolateral portal, once again, is very important. This is the key part. You have to be aggressive on clearing up the lateral soft tissue. Do not be afraid. Try to find the free edge. Release your middle guinea humeral ligament completely. And then we'll use it later for suture shuttling. Then we start preparing the bed. This is an intraarticular repair. So we're looking posterior and it's through the anterolateral portal, not the anterior one. I start preparing the bony bed for the subscap using a shaver and I use a, a, a rasp as well. I need to get a good bloody footprint for the repair. If it's a retracted tear, then I put in a traction suture. It will help me with reduction of passing sutures and if I need any more releases. Anchor insertion. You can insert the anchors for, from either anterior portus, either from the anterior one or from the anterolateral one. You can use both to insert your anchors. But try to get your hand, if you're using the anterior portal, move your hand a little bit medial. <coughs> I pass my sutures. Usually you need only just one anchor in a modified Mason Allen uh, type of suture where there are two horizontal matrix sutures through one suit, but using one suture and then a simple suture using the other suture medial to the, to, to the horizontal matrix. When you tie, start tying up your knots, you start with the matrix, suture, uh, the matrix suture, you tie it first to reduce the tear and then the simple suture. And this is how you should end up. As you can see, the subscap is completely back uh, fixed to its footprint with the rolled upper edge of the subscap clearly visible. This is how I do my subscap. I think if you follow these steps, it will be an easy surgery. The most important step is to clear up the rotator interval and the lateral footprint. How about coracoplasty? This is an interesting question. Do we need to do a coracoplasty? Our f friends in North America do it quite often because they feel that the coracohumeral distance, which is normally about 11 millimeters, 
is reduced in these stairs. I personally do not do it. I feel that when the subscap is torn, the head sublux is a little bit anterior. This is what gets the space to be a little bit uh, short. Once I repair the subscap, then this space gets back to normal. I don't think we need to do it. Another way of repairing it is doing it from the bursal side. When you, most of the time you can do it from articular side, but if it's a large tear, then you can look from the lateral portal, as you can see here. It gives you a better visualization of the anterior compartment, so it helps you with your, with your, your releases. Do we have to do it from this way as our French uh, fellows do? No, you can do it most of the time from the intraarticular side, but this is another way of doing it. For retracted tears, it gives you a better visualization of the tendon, the footprint, and the anterior compartment. But it's exactly the same steps. The most important step is to clear up the soft tissue and to find the free edge of the subscap. So my take-home message is always look for a subscap tear when you have an anterosuperior cuff tear. You have to suspect there is a subscap as well. Proper interval release is very important. If you cannot see the clear, clearly the upper edge of the subscap and the footprint clearly, then just release all the rotator interval and try to find the free edge. Forward flexion, internal rotation, and doing a posterior push may help you visualize the footprint. I think the cornerstone of doing a proper subscap repair is the anterolateral portal. You need two working portals. The anterolateral portal, if you're not doing it yet, you should start doing it. It makes your life much more easy. And you have to be methodical in your repair. It's one step at a time. You have to clear up the soft tissues properly, and it's just going to be an easy repair. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ahmed. Great, yeah. Fantastic, Dr. Ahmed. So, my name's Neil Jane from the United Kingdom. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Michael Simone, uh, all the way from Brazil, in fact. That's a long, even further than me. And uh, he's going to present on posterior shoulder instability of the whole journey by the look of things. So, Thank obrigado. you so much. <laughs> well, um, I come from Brazil, but I live in Switzerland now, so it's <laughs> just uh, three hours and a half flights, not so far. So yeah, I go to Brazil every couple of months, but my house is in St. Gallen, Switzerland. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about posterior shoulder instability from rehab, arthroscopy repair, repair uh, until open repair. Again, my disclosure. So first we have to establish what is a posterior shoulder instability. We're talking about dislocations, which is like um, mostly not uncommon condition, 4 to 5% of all shoulder dislocations, related to direct trauma, seizures, and attrition, uh, and attrition acute lock chronic or unlock chronic, or we're talking about instability, what we see in around 4 18% uh, of the athletes in instability events. So first, the etiology is a little bit different. So if you take contact sports, they will probably have some more as a traumatic event, uh, common in football, soccer, skiers, but the overhead athletes, they has an etiology related to posterior capsule uh, attenuation, progressive uh, labrum tear, and repetitive trauma. You can go all the way to the radical points, locked chronic dislocation, it's a known condition related most to trauma and treated by many different things from reduction to uh, procedures like the near McLaughlin procedure until uh, a replacement. But I think it's better in this meeting to talk about what is recurrent posterior instability. Those who had symptoms and signs related to pain, instability in flexion and internal rotation, scapular winging, jerk tests, posterior relocation tests, and many, many other tests that were described during the literature. So when you're searching for posterior instability, what do you have to look for in order to get a proper diagnosis, a proper pathology, and then a path for treatment? First, hyperlaxity. Hyperlaxity is an issue. Most of the patients has motor directional instability, and hyperlaxity together with posterior shoulder posterior laxity are common in those patients. What about glenoid retroversion? Some patients will have uh, uh, aumented retroversion, like uh, described this angle by Richard Friedman, 
and that has to be evaluated in order to determine which procedure we're going to do if we get to a surgical procedure anytime. What about posterior labor tears and posterior bone loss? It's very common in the MRI to find posterior damage in the labrum. Is it always related to symptoms? So we have to correlate, like usually, MRI with the symptoms that we feel. So it's important to evaluate those symptoms at all. Uh, those some articles, very recent articles, one by, by Matt Preventure, the other by John Tokish, published in the last year in the literature in Atroscopy in American Journal of Sports Medicine, studying and showing that there is a prevalence and there is probably more glenoid uh, alterations in the back caused by those damage and those subsequent instability causing bone attenuation and labor tear attenuation. What about the reverse heel sex lesion? Also an important step, uh, Philippe Moroder had described the gamma angle. It's a way, it's uh, an analogy that we could make with the glenoid tract showing that each larger, the, the heel sex, the, the reverse heel sex lesion is, can be connected to instability. And finally, you always have to look for scapular dyskinesia because it can be a cause and also a consequence because posterior shoulder instability is also related to uh, winging of the scapula. What about imaging studies? I believe that the MRI in our hands is the gold standard because we can evaluate the labor, labor damage, and damage and also we can look for the attenuation. But CT scan also will work if you're looking for retroversion. Uh, we have to look now uh, uh, for the bipolar lesions when you have a lesion in front of the shoulder, a small heel sex lesion, reverse, and a small labor lesion. And uh, there's an article also by Philippe Moroder who studied a lot of these issues uh, concerning the fact that we should probably take care of both sides. Uh, <coughs> that's a, that's a, a, a diagram by, by Imhoff when he described his way to approach posterior shoulder dislocation. It's a very, very busy slide, but I just want to show that in the middle of, the, of his uh, organogram is the bone defect. So he based most of his treatment for posterior shoulder instability in the defects that we have in the humor head, so-called the reverse hill sex lesion. Well, in my hands, those cases are always first for conservative treatment. Muscle strengthening, proprioception, uh, posture correction, and then we're going to train the sports, depending on which sport the guy does, we're going to train specific movement from these sports, gradual return to sports, uh, and the point is that usually they will take four to six months. The question is, is that worth? Uh, there are some articles, uh, these articles published now in July 2019 by Woodmass, that shows that 46% of these patients progress to surgery in one to 10 years. And in his hand, in general, 70% of these patients with posterior shoulder instability one time is going to, for surgical treatment. So that's why I ask, is that worse to wait so long? Well, my opinion is yes, because uh, maybe not six months, but at least three months, because most of the patients that don't have a real uh, uh, major disruption in the posterior wall will get better with rehab. So in order to, to decide the treatment, we have to have a good understanding of the pathology, better quality of imaging studies, better atroscopy techniques, and tool to fix the labrum when it's needed. So that's a... a a video showing an atroscopic posterior labrum. We also do this, although I know people say it's more difficult, I always do, I do everything in beach chair position. Um, even posterior labrum is possible. That's a video, not for me, that's a video, of course, it's a video for my friend uh, Beno Ejdeman from Brazil, uh, showing a uh, repair. He also does everything in beach chair position. That's a very pretty standard procedure. I'm not gonna show exactly the technique. Uh, and remember that it can be associated with a uh, hemplissage for the reverse heel sex lesion. Uh, that's a procedure that we've been doing lately. Uh, that's, I have to tell, is a cadaveric demonstration uh, done in Naples, Florida, uh, showing the way that we can use uh, uh, fixation with a, with a corkscrew FT and a swivel lock, uh, tr exactly doing what is, what is a remplissage, but the anterior wall to fix that heel uh, uh, sex to cover that fix that with a subscap. So when you have a bone loss, maybe we should go also for a procedure with a bone graft. So we can do this bone graft procedure uh, when we have um, a retroversion or we decided that's the best approach to go. So again, we have to treat 
the pathology as it is. It's not only a basic procedure, fix the labrum or do a bone block. You have to look for all those issues that I showed in the beginning. Is there retroversion? Is there bone loss? Is there labrum to repair? And then you can adjust the treatment. So specific for each kind of anatomy. Um, there's a lot of articles showing uh, the, the, the efficiency of the repair of the posterior labrum in young uh, uh, athletes with a good results in returning, uh, but some of those patients will keep on having some uh, pain and subtle pain and they trend over time to diminish also their good results. But I, I think that posterior shoulder instability is also very mysterious to deal with. Be careful with patients uh, that have also some a psychological issue. So I got this case, it's a very tricky case. This patient uh, is a 28 years old. Uh, she was a workman's compensation in Brazil. She had a posterior atraumatic instability. And when she got to me, she had already three procedures, two arthroscopic procedures and one uh, bony block procedure. Um, he got, she got a glenoid wedge ostomy, sorry, uh, with, with no bony block, but a wedge ostomy. She had no function. She has her arm locked in internal rotation as she had a locked posterior dislocation. But in fact, I couldn't see here in the CT scan uh, any kind of really locking. So the, the humeral head was sitting there in the back. And she has four months without raising her arm. She couldn't move her arm from the side. So I decided to search an option for her, as she had already a, a glenoid osteotomy and two prior procedures. In my opinion, she was not rehab good for the first time. And we ended up doing a procedure, very rare, but it's already, uh, uh, I saw a, a, a lecture in Paris last year about the Kuvalchuk procedure, which is a, a, a chromium flap with a deltoid, which is fixed in the posterior glenoid. I would say that this is a reverse Larage but instead of using the coracoid, it's using a, a chromium with deltoid. So this procedure worked very fine. I had the chance to do only one time in my life, and she was this uh, one year. But when I was in Paris, I presented the case. Some people of the audience who had done this procedure said, well, anything that happens, she will get back and deteriorate her status for, for, for the symptoms. And it really happens. She was in a workman's compensation medical exam, to, to uh, free her to go back to work. And when the physician tried to examine her, he dislocated, that was her story, her, she dislocated her in the back and she went back to the stage that she was before. Not completely locked, but she got very weak function and she lost all of this situation. So I believe that um, my, my point is that posterior shoulder instability, um, you have to be very careful the first time you touch it. Uh, maybe you have to look if there is really pathology because some patients can be tricky and can leave you to bad results and it's not uncommon to see pa pa patients who had multiple procedures for posterior instability. So I would say that my pearls, first to understand the, the correct diagnosis. Are we doing with a posterior traumatic dislocation? Are we doing with an unstable subto shoulder? Are we doing to some kind of MDI? What are we doing with this? So the correct diagnostic is crucial because the, the variety of pathologies are pretty big. Uh, it's pretty big. Avoid surgery in atraumatic posterior instability in, in hyperlax young females. That can be a problem. If you fix them the first time, then you, you probably gonna be in trouble for other procedures. Rehab comes first but don't wait too long in athletes. So if you see an athlete, he's damaging his career, he's too long trying to do his rehab, so maybe, and there is a pathology, there is a clear labral detachment, there is a clear uh, alteration or bone loss in the back, maybe it's a good thing to not wait too long to fix that, as the, the literature is showing that sometime in the future he probably will be fixed. The technique should address the lesions and the concomitant lesions. It's not, there is not one procedure for that. It's not, I do this for a posterior shoulder instability. No, I have to look what this posterior shoulder instability is about and fix what I can. Be careful with bone loss. Bone loss is an issue. I remember back in the 90s, uh, Dr. Rick Matson used to tell us, you know, the problem is not only the ligament, the problem is the bone. We always pointed out that we look, look for bone as the same, the same way that we're looking for the bone now in the anterior instability, we have to look for the bone in posterior instability. Uh, overhead and throwers, that, that's a quote by Jim Bradley in 2014. He has a very nice lecture over posterior instability and he says that overhead and throwers, too loose is better than too tight. 
but in contact athletes too tight is better than too loose so that's code and i believe that of course he's specifying which kind of uh, trauma which kind of sports movement the, the the athlete has in order to treat them again that was my last lecture here in this in this course i'm very very honored and very pleased to be in egypt for my first time beautiful country beautiful people thank you so much for having me here Sir, the speaker, Dr. Alessandro Catania. Yeah, Castagna, Castagna. Well, Alex, Alex is enough. Alessandro, yes. One well, second, we need our connection. About glenoid fractures, arthroscopic treatment. Yes, thank you. Here comes the presentation. I prepared this presentation to cover the absence of my friend Enrico Gervasi, you know the story of Italy and the COVID-19 or coronavirus if you wish. I am brave enough, but I'm very happy to be here. So, we can start? Yes. Thank you. Again, disclosure, nothing to do with this. Now, very special, my last presentation. Uh, this is a co-author of this presentation, Mohamed Moursi is Egyptian. He was a traveling fellow with me a few years ago. You see the picture on the left here. And since he was studying at that time in the Paracelsus Medical University in Salzburg, uh, he did some studies about the fracture of the glenoid. So I want to involve him because involving him, I'm involving the Egyptian community. And he's also very delighted that he told me all the best to my friends in Egypt. I'm, I'm happy to go there whenever eventually they will want. Anyways, arthroscopic treatment of glenoid fractures. First of all, the epidemiology. It is a rather uncommon fracture, about 0.1 of all the body fracture. 10% of them are substantially displaced. So 0.1 is all over, and only 10% of the 0.1 is significantly displaced. Glenoid frosta fracture are high energy or anterior abortion or body modin or uh, rim fractures are the vast majority of it. What is the pathomechanism of the fracture of the glenoid? It can be indirect, like an abortion, and it is the typical dislocation that is detaching a little piece of the glenoid rim, uh, glenoid rim along with the labrum and the capsule away from the bone or direct impact, depression. Uh, in this case, you may have a major fracture. It is like the dislocation, but the mechanism is, very, is the same that. So we may have an avulsion fracture. You see in the left a little avulsion of a piece of bone with the labrum and then a more substantial fracture. And then here is the depression, depression fracture. You see the drawing over the picture there. You can see, but you, you must be very careful. You must look always if you have a continuity of the white line here of the cortical bone over the glenoid. If you don't see it in continuity, be suspicious for a glenoid rim fracture. So this is the little trick with the standard X-ray. This is the Edeberg. It is a mistake there. Modified by Gauss in the classification. You see we have type 1, just involving somehow the glenoid rim. And then we, the, we have the type 2 involving the body and then extending along the spina and more complicated fracture ranging from uh, uh, 5, A, B, C and, 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 and 6. That these are the typical fractures. Then Louis Bigliani described this avulsion also. That is something that we see quite frequently in our daily life with this type 1, type 2 and type 3 that may include more or less just the labrum and the capsule, significant displacement and total avulsion with bony deficiency. And this is Marcus Scheibel, another former fellow of mine, a raising star in the, in, the field, in the field of shoulder surgery, a very good boy, who did also this classification, including acute, chronic, and chronic without, with, with or without uh, a fragment dislocation. So chronicity is also important. But let's go back to the Edeberg classification because this is something that is creating a sort of threshold for the arthroscopic or open treatment. Because if we have a type 1A or 1B, whatever, it is arthroscopic. 
especially in the acute phase, as you will see. All the rest is uh, open reduction and internal fixation. So if we are dealing with this kind of fracture and we want to do some arthroscopy, of course there are some attempts described in the literature, but they are quite complicated condition. What about the pre-op imaging? Uh, we need just to start up these x-rays in two planes and then always have a check for the scapula, the chest, the clavicula, the acromion, because you may have a floating shoulder, you know what it is, or the humerus and the elbow. And here again, if you follow the white line of the cortical bone, you understand that even a standard X-ray may lead you into the direction. However, the full understanding is raising, as already mentioned today, by the CT scan, including a 3D reconstruction, with the head that is subtracted and unfast view. So you have this unfast, that means a sagittal plane, and you can easily see the fracture if you're studying it. Then, uh, this is the study that was leading later on to the on track, off track. It is AG Toy, 2000, 20 years ago, that was studying the bony deficiency with this system. Uh, with these osteotomy lines, he did a study cutting the bone away in order to study the stability. And he decided that 21% uh, may, may be related to 6.5 millimeter of glenoid length. And again, another classification to evaluate this is Sugaya, where you can make this study comparing the difference between A in capital letter and A in a lower case, where you can really make a, a relationship and understand the amount of bone that you are missing. What, which are the indications for surgery? Here is what we find in the literature. Giuseppe Porcellini, my friend from Italy, described 18 years ago that you can fix this uh, with suture anchors with less than 25%. Marcus Scheibel, less than 25 with suture anchor, more than 25 with open screw fixation. Pascal Boileau, compression fracture, you have higher risk, separation fracture, distraction. It is probably the better indication. Yamamoto, anterior defect, around 25% the stability ratio. But however, the literature is not telling us which is the minimal size of the bony defect indicating surgical treatment. So we need to think also about this. So this is what is reported in the literature because conservative treatment for the fracture of the glenoid is not something that we should forget. I should say we should always think about it. And this is a series of 14 cases uh, creating this with the large 5 millimeters displaced 2 millimeters anterior glenoid fractures. You see that the constant score at the end was 98, no redislocation, no subluxation, no apprehension, and no symptomatic osteoarthritis. However, they develop this very likely, but not so symptomatic. But let's go now to arthroscopic treatment. Criteria for surgery, displacement should be above 2 millimeters with the subluxation of the humor head, less uh, of 20%, um, you go for suture anchor fixation. Uh, otherwise, if it is more than 20%, you may go for a screw fixation. So, potential advantages of the arthroscopic treatment, precise anatomical restoration, avoiding soft tissue iatrogenic injury, uh, possibility to add other procedure like McLaughlin repressage or whatever, and there are many potential different techniques that you are described. Percutaneous pinning, cannulated screws, suture anchors, or even endobotum. The advantage is it is minimal and invasive, allows you to see everything, reduces the infection rate, and equal fragment stability. Some techniques for that. This is an arthroscopic screw fixation. You see the fragment here. And after cleaning and removing all, all the blood, whenever you enter such shoulders, of course, you, you find a, a clot of blood. Okay. And, and then you evaluate the stability of the system. Already shown earlier this, this morning or early afternoon, you must mobilize your bone block. Please note something that is crucial. I will come over this later on. You see the labrum here. If you have the labrum that is very common in this non-majorly displaced thing, you can fix this simply 
reposition in the superior labrum and you will obtain immediately the reduction and then you stabilize it with an anchor or two anchors, whatever you want. You see what happens here, bringing back the labrum, you bring back the bone fragment and in this case, with some pinning and cannulated screw, you can stabilize it. To do so, you need to have a quite a big, consistent piece of bone, otherwise this will be destroyed by the repair. But however, also you must be careful with the inclination in order not to place your, we already discussed this for the latter J, but the principles are the same, not to have any metal that insisting inside the joint. So be very careful about the angle that you're reaching and your landmark is the coracoid telling you where you are. This is a clinical case and you see the fracture, you see very clearly in the CT scan 2D and again this is the technique with two cannulated screw with the pinning and the reduction. But however, there are relevant pitfalls similar to the latter J screw malpositioning is detrimental for the shoulder so please be sure that you are safe because they, you may create severe head cartilage damage. Or you may have an intraoperative fragment fracture. That is, of course, a, a nightmare because you don't know how, how to manage this. These are the results reported by exactly the authors, including Mohamed Morsi. I don't know if the pronunciation is good. And the size of the fragment that they treated was an average of 26%, so exactly on the border of what we were discussing before, with excellent clinical result, 94 as a always score. Puccio Porcellini described the technique with the suture anchors that is not very complicated, but after the first series, he reported the second series recommending acute treatment, not chronic one. And again, if you have the labrum, you can easily bring back the, the piece of bone if you reduce the labrum into, into the original position. You may be in the joint, you don't understand anything, you take the labrum, bring it up, boom, everything goes back into the position. And this is Hiro Sugaya, a little more brave, similar principles, but he says maybe even 27, so it's getting closer to 30%, is more aggressive, but I mean, at the end saying 25 or 27 doesn't make any sense. There are other techniques like this bony banquet bridge procedure. So just in order to reduce and compress down using also some resorbable pins to reduce the piece of bone. And this is a video from the company and then using the bone stitcher that is a tool that was developed by Hero. So this is Hero toy. So you see again the labrum here. You place your anchor, you can use whatever. What I like to do personally, I, I don't use this unless you have a big piece, a relatively big piece of bone here. I place an anchor here, I pull up the labrum, I obtain my reduction and I, I stabilize the system then. And most of the cases you can make it. And this is something that you can, okay, not running, maybe yes, no. I'm not sure, make a final attempt. Yes, maybe it's moving, yes. This is the CT scan. This is the, the fracture and you can tell it is a fresh one. You refresh it. Hmm. Sorry, beg your pardon. I let it go, because if I touch this, it is stopping then. So I'm not indicating anything, I just talk over it. So you see the glenoid rim with a fresh fracture, refresh again. You need to get very mobile, very mobile bone fragment. With this curette, you remove all the scar tissue that is formed there, fibrous tissue, that may prevent the healing. This is how you preload your fragment with the sutures and then with the bone stitchers with the bone stitcher you go through it you retrieve the the suture through it and you compress down anyways the video is not running very well so with what are what is the comparison between arthroscopic or open procedure there are many different possible techniques but probably within a certain amount of bony deficiency and especially again 
if the labrum is still there, you can do this by the scope quite easily. You can do this also posterior, as described by Michael one second ago. In some rare cases, this is the only thing that I found in the literature very recently last year. This is a case series, seven patients with this posterior fracture that uh, I honestly probably never or almost observed, but this may happen, of course, and you can fix it with a similar technique. So, arthroscopic techniques are rising, of course. There are advantages for that. The subscapularis is uh, protected, and it is somehow technically demanding. You may have complication if you use metallic pinning, CT scan with 3D reconstruction, screw, screw fixation, suture anchor, or if you have a comminuted one, you may go to an OREF, or if you have a very unstable shoulder, even use a latter J in some cases. And then you need to have a reliable fragment that yields, no loss of reduction, you must give some compression. Uh, it is preventing early osteoarthritis and restoration of the shoulder stability is demanded. Uh, this is the clinical outcomes of the previous paper that with good, good results and they were happy and uh, as the, I am all happy to have been here for this Congress and grateful for the invitation. This is my last presentation and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, and last in this session I will call Dr. Neil Jain from United Kingdom to talk about AC joint instability. Thanks very much, and humbled to be in such great company up, up here today. Um, thank you. Lovely, thanks very much. So I'm going to talk about AC joint instability, probably quite basic compared with what you've heard already, um, and we'll probably know a lot of this already, so it's a bit of a, an overview and then a couple of little tidbits. Once again, thanks on behalf of Boster for welcoming me and my colleagues here to, uh, these couple of days. How can I get an Egyptian audience interested in the AC joint. <laughs> mm, yeah, bad time, bad day this, wasn't it? Bad day. So I thought we'd talk a bit about the anatomy, the classification, the treatment algorithm that I use within our healthcare system in the UK, a couple of maybe unusual presentations, and then perhaps another pathology that we might see with the AC joint, just to finish off. Brief overview of the anatomy, we know it's, it's the AC ligament, so combining the superior, inferior, anterior and posterior AC ligaments that all kind of blend together to form that circumferential capsule around the AC joint. They're responsible primarily for the AP stability of the AC joint, but also contribute to the supero-inferior stability. The bulk of the supero-inferior stability though is the paired coracoclavicular ligaments, the conoid and trapezoid ligaments. Uh, combining for up to 80% of that supero-inferior stability. And we're probably all very familiar with this as the classification system. It's been the, the rock on which we've built all our treatment options and algorithms going forward for the last goodness knows how many years. The rockwood classification 1, 2 and 3, generally speaking, we haven't operated 4, 5 and 6. We have. But what is non-operative treatment? Is it just saying, oh yeah, you'll be fine, off you go, uh, don't trouble me again? No, they, they do need a period of formal immobilization with a broad arm supportive sling rather than a collar and cuff, simply to support the arm and the weight of the arm. And then mobilizing as far as pain permits the patients. Normally a return to sport somewhere between two and three months, dependent upon stability and whether or not the is to pain. That's more in grade one and two rather than grade three. The operative treatment, well, that's traditionally been some form of coracoclavicular ligament reconstruction. We've done using a graft or a synthetic ligament has all been described. And that's led to, it's not really a controversy, is it, when the vast majority of grade three still get better without surgery. But there was this so-called controversy about grade three. Can, you know, do we operate on some, do we not operate on others? And I think most can be treated non-operatively, particularly in the non-sporting um, group, but also within the sporting group as well. Now in the National Health Service, patients get given some form of immobilization on day one, 
when they tend at, at the, uh, thank you, the emergency department in the UK. They often then come to our fracture clinic in the first week or two afterwards, sometimes in a collar and cuff, so the first thing is to switch them to the sling. And then we'll say, right, we will leave you be for four weeks and then we'll see you back. And during that four weeks, the key questions are to ask, is the pain getting better or improving? Is it getting worse or is it just staying the same? And at that week four appointment, we'll also test for stability using the piano key test, but also looking at AP translation to help determine whether this is going to be that one out of 20 patient who's going to go on to be remaining unstable. And it's led to this kind of algorithm that we've adopted in our department. Essentially, pain gets better, shoulder gets stable, no need for surgery. That's pretty straightforward. The pain gets better, but they still feel a little bit unstable. Bide your time, sit it out and wait. And the vast majority of these will get better as well. If they remain unstable, you can have that discussion about whether surgery is, is a benefit for them. But if they're not in any pain, that, that would be with caution as well. The difficult one is where the pain seemingly is no different. It's just the same. But when you examine the patient, they feel stable. Again, do your best to reassure and sit it out. Hold your nerve, as we would say, and review them two to four weeks later, keeping them in a sling, and most of the time it's improved. Now, it's when the pain is the same or worse, but they feel unstable after about four weeks. In our experience, they've never really gone on to stability, and they've remained unstable, and they're the ones we would then go on to have surgery. There are some sports-specific considerations to think about as well. High-risk sports are both contact and non-contact sports. The contact sport popular in England is rugby. I appreciate it's different in, the, in North America and it would be more American football. The non-contact sports, Great Britain uh, is, is a powerhouse suddenly at cycling. We've had more Tour de France winners in the last 10 years than we have in the previous 100. We've won more gold medals in cycling in the last 12 years than we had in the previous 100. And as a result, cycling has become incredibly popular now in the UK. So is the triathlon and motorcycling is, is still quite popular as well. All of which although non-contact sports technically are at high risk of falling and injuring their AC joint. What we try and do is that if the patient is a contact athlete, we try our best to treat them non-operatively due to the high risk of recurrence. We would try the same for the non-contact athletes, except the problem specific to cycling. They have real trouble getting in the time trialing position. Now for those people not, not so much familiar with that, this is the, uh, the position. Okay. On, on the left of the screen, that's the time trial position. And you need to support you, a good amount of your body weight on your arms. So as a result, a lot of that force is progressed up your arm into the axial skeleton at your AC joint. And they really struggle with that if they haven't got a stable AC joint. The chap on the right is Geraint Thomas. He's our most recent Tour de France winner in the, in the UK. He's Welsh. And when they climb up, up the mountains, they're often pushing and propelling their bike on the weight of their arms as well. They also really struggle with that. So cyclists literally present on day one after the injury expecting surgery for us. But what operation is it that we do? Well, there's the hook plate, there's the weaver done, there's a hamstring graft and there's a synthetic graft. There's also the possibility of excising the distal clavicle. Some people do that routinely, some people don't. Uh, it was originally described with the original weaver done and is often done with the hook plate as well. We tend to do it for chronic cases where we're not able to reduce it due to the amount of scarring that's formed uh, in the interim. But when you do excise the distal clavicle, and after you've reconstructed your CC ligaments, however you do it, it's really important to check the AP stability. Because in excising the distal clavicle, you may have decreased the AP stability from removing the AC ligaments. We're probably all familiar with the hook plate. This is an option. It's, it's gone out of favour in the UK recently. Uh, we don't really do that very much anymore. Similarly, the weaver done the tra transposition of the coracoacromial ligament from the acromion into an excised distal clavicle at the lateral end of the clavicle and sutured in place. Again, with the advent of newer techniques, we, we've kind of gone away from that in the UK. I know a hamstrings graft is quite popular, particularly for chronic cases, allowing some introduction of biology, and there's been some very good results with that. There's arthroscopic techniques, the dog bone technique, which can be used. That's something I'd do for an acute case if I got to them within two weeks. But the nature of um, our health system in the UK is that we don't really get that opportunity unless it's in the private sector. Then there's the, another type of artificial graft, such as the surgery league. 
This loops around the coracoid, reconstructing the CC ligaments, and that involves an AP screw in the distal clavicle. Now, when we think about which is best, there was a recent uh, review in the, in the literature which showed they're all fairly similar, the only difference being a slightly increased constant score of the, of the autologous or allograft that can be used, which was quite, quite an interesting finding. In terms of what I do, I do this. Now, let's see if this video works. So this is called an infinity lock. It's a type of um, synthetic graft, which is different to the surgery league and different to fiber tape in that it's a, a woven rather than braided polyester, which allows ingrowth as well as ongrowth. And that's why we, we kind of preferred it. We take this hook, we pass a passing wire around the base of the coracoid. It's got to be done by an open procedure. Through the loop of the, the wire, we pass this epibond suture, which is attached to the open end of a lark's foot type patterning of this synthetic ligament. We can then remove that epibond suture and pass the two legs or, or arms of the ligament through the loop, looping it around the base of the coracoid. There's a few nuances to this. We have to make sure we really push the, push the ligament down to the base of the coracoid. After reducing the clavicle and often holding it with a K wire, we then pass a guide wire by cortical drill. And then if only it was as easy as this video, we, we pass the uh, sutures back up and through and we tie it over an ender button on top, again, having the clavicle reduced. We then loop the posterior limb round to the front, tie another knot and suture the two limbs down to avoid any prominence which can be irritable for the patients, particularly these really thin cyclists. Now that seems to work quite well in our hands. We compared a group of about 30 um, surgery leaks that were done previously and then the first 30 or so of these infinity locks that we did. The ASCS score seemed to be fairly similar, but we noticed a significant improvement in the Nottingham ACJ score, which is a, a specific score for AC joint pathology. So that's what we tend to do going forward. Sometimes we augment that. AP instability is possible following that surgery for supero inferior instability, as I say, particularly if we've excised the distal clavicle. And so to help prevent that, we've adopted a procedure now where we simply place an internal brace across the acromioclavicular joint, a simple fiber tape with two swivel locks. And that seemingly corrects any AP instability. We've had a, a few cases, only a handful, not enough to really write up, where people have either had excision of AC joint or uh, sorry, as a, as a primary procedure for AC at joint OA or as part of the coracoclavicular ligament reconstruction, persistent AP instability, and this has corrected it for them. Just to finish on for the last couple of minutes, there's another type of pathology that, that we've, dis, we've kind of become more and more aware of, and that's what we'll term an injury to the AC joint disc. These are patients who seemingly reported a grade one or grade two injury, and it never really got better for them. It's also the grade three patient that becomes stable but still has a lot of pain. On imaging with MR we've excluded osteoarthritis and distal clavicle osteoarthritis but there is high signal seen within the joint in and around the AC disc and for each of these patients it improved, their pain completely improved on injection of steroid and local anesthetic with ultrasound guidance. It was then if the pain recurred we went on to excise their AC disc. It's just a little bit of detail of the anatomy of the AC joint disc. It's not present in everybody. I think it's only about 18% of people that will have a full disc and then type 2 have part of a disc. So all these patients really were the type 1s. So it's not something we'll see in everybody. These were some of the findings interoperatively. That's the disc there. That's the acromioclavicular disc after we've removed the inferior um, acromioclavicular ligament and this is following excision of the disc. Now with the best will in the world we try and ex excise the disc on its own but often to fit the instruments in we have to take off a little bit of the end of the clavicle through which we're trying to maintain the AC ligaments obviously as much as we can and doing this arthroscopically we're often able to maintain the superior and posterior AC ligaments. Our results have been quite promising we've only got eight cases but the preoperative ASES score and the preoperative Nottingham ACJ score both significantly increased um, the ASES score in, in many getting back near to absolutely normal. So it's something else to just consider. 
So in summary, AC instability is common and it is important, but actually most won't need an operation. Those different surgical options exist and not one seemingly is better than the rest. So we'd probably end up saying, do what's best in your hands in this case. But I strongly advise thinking about AP instability, anterior posterior instability, as well as the superior or inferior instability, particularly when performing a distal clavicle excision as well. And if we do that, and if we do it well, maybe 12 months after a very sad time, you'll get someone smiling instead. All right. Thanks very much for having me in Egypt. Um, shukran. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dr. Jean, for this nice presentation. Any question? Dr. Uh, Ahmed uh, Hani, subscapular stair, evaluation with treatment. Second speaker. Dr. Ahmed. Um, I was just wondering, what, what's your rehab protocol for these patients? How much does it differ from your supraspinatus patients? Is there a different type of sling, different restrictions and such like? Well, actually it doesn't differ that much except that I limit the external rotation to neutral for the first four to six weeks, but other than that, it doesn't differ that much. Uh, especially if it's a retracted tear, I don't want to stress it that much, so just limiting the external rotation for the first period, post operative period. You do a bicep stenotomy in all cases to, in order to see the superior border of the subscap? Yes. And you fix it later? Or? Yes, yes. I usually, if I'm going to fix it, I do a subpectral tenodesis. Okay. So I do a tenotomy always, and if I'm going to fix it, I'll do a subpectral tenodesis. Okay. Yes, uh, the point is a lateral projection of the coracoid. Is it the lateral projection or is it the distance between the coracoid and the humerus? Uh, no, the, the projection of the coracoid. The lateral projection of the coracoid. The coracoid index. It's, yeah, it, it, but the, you know the lateral projection of a coracoid were several studies that shows that it's a normal finding, but it, mo most of the people it doesn't bother them. So I think it's more about the coracoid impinging on your repair. What I feel is that the subscap, when it's torn, especially if it's a, if it's a complete tear, yes. it subluxes a little bit anterior. So assessing the coracohumeral different, uh, diff, uh, distance preoperatively is, is a false, it gives you a false impression because once you repair the subscap, you're going to push it back. Yes, uh, but I, I, I didn't mention the, the, the distance between the coracoid. Yeah, I'm talking about the, the lateral distance, projection. Yes. Yes, because uh, in most cases of subscapularis, uh, I have just realized that th there is much uh, more length in the coracoid. Uh, I don't do regular uh, coracoplasty, but uh, and I didn't. Uh, uh, I don't know if it is necessary or not, but uh, I think uh, there is um, larger coracoid in these cases. I don't know why. Well, uh, I personally haven't. Uh, I, I always clear up the coracoid, so I see it very well during my release. And I haven't noticed that the coracoids in these patients is much different than any others. I don't know what, what, the, what you think. Tour Muhammad Sobhi. About the coracoplasty, it's a maneuver you can do if there is uh, no much room uh, to do uh, during the subscap repair. Uh, after uh, doing the posterior lever of the arm, the posterior lever maneuver uh, of the arm, if still the room for the your repair, the surgical technique you do still narrow, you can take down and do a recession of the coracoid. Yes, but the, the, the described technique for the coracoplasty is to remove the, the tendon and then shave it and to, to decrease the length of the coracoid. 
uh, so it's not just shaving. I didn't, uh, I don't do uh, uh, crocoplasty, but I'm always wondering if it is important to, to, to look at this or not, because uh, sometimes um, I have uh, uh, found cases with isolated subscapularis, mm -hmm. without trauma, uh, and I find this always the, the, the longer crocoid is a, a, a constant finding in these cases. Or limited type uh, just, discussion. Just Please. long. Just long uh, coracoid, you mean? Yes. But the point yes. that it's, uh, it's, dangers it's, the subscapularis... It's called uh, uh, coracoid index positive one or two. It, it is measured from a uh, tangent, uh, tangential line from the glenoid. Mm -hmm. uh, any crossing, you can measure it. Yes. It, yeah, lateral yes. projecting coracoid. Lateral projecting. Lateral projection. But uh, I mean, this is in another direction. The direction that push into or... Uh, about the uh, subscapularis is a little bit in another direction. I think he's talking about it could injure the subscap in internal rotation. This yes. is what you think, right? Yes. Yeah, I think you should uh, you should do a systematic research of this uh, problem. Maybe you you, f you find something for us. Okay, thank you. Okay, may I have uh, just one one question for Ahmed? For Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed, uh, is there any evidence that uh, the double row subscap refer can do any better than the single row? Well, the footprint of the subscap is, is actually the biggest footprint for all the rotator cuff. So if you have a larger tear, yeah, maybe most of the time you only need a single row because it's an upper border tear. But if you have a large tear, what I usually do is I do a double row, but since we don't have, we cannot use a lot of anchors now here. So the lateral, I usually use the anterior anchor of the supraspinatus, the anterolateral anchor for supraspinatus repair, I use it as a double row repair for the subscap. So if you can imagine the lateral anchor for the supraspinatus repair, the anterior one, for the double row, I use it as well to, to shuttle the sutures of the subscap. Yeah, if it's a larger tear, there are some studies that shows, show that it, the, the results are better in restoring the footprint, but most of the tears are small and you don't need it, I think. Thanks, Dr. Ahmed. For the second speaker, Dr. Simoni, posterior shoulder instability. Any question? Sir, the speaker, Dr. Katana, glenoid fractures. Any question for the last speaker, Dr. Jean? Thank you for at the for the end of the, this discussion. Many thanks.